I, I read once, passingly, about a man named Shakespeare. I only read about him passing, passingly, but I remember one thing he wrote that kind of moved me. Uh, he put it in the mouth of Hamlet, I think it was, who said, to be or not to be. He was in doubt about something. <laughs> Whether it was nobler in the mind of man to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, moderation, or to take up arms, against the sea of troubles and by opposing, end them. And I go for that. If you take up arms, you'll end it. But if you sit around and wait for the one who's, who's in power to make up his mind that he should end it, you'll be waiting a long time. And in my opinion, the young generation of whites, blacks, brown, whatever else there is, you're living at a time of extremism, a time of revolution, a time when there's got to be a change. People in power have misused it, and now there has to be a change, and a better world has to be built and the only way it's going to be built with it, with it, it with, is with extreme methods and I for one will join in with anyone don't care what color you are as long as you want to change this miserable condition that exists on this earth thank you Malcolm was always involved somewhere in the struggle whatsoever ye do do all to the glory Oh God. That's a great principle. Yes. What's happening? I don't see anything. Well, Gilchrist experience. So the monitor's not working. We are here. We, are. <laughs> we have each other to depend upon. Uh, <laughs> well, uh, welcome to the Gilchrist experience. Um, I, I'm flat. So I can see that we're on or not. Even if you, the if technology, <laughs> we move forward without All right. the technology. Uh, I tell you what, just let's come back. Run out of all in and we'll come right back at you. Nobody on the show. Right? There's nothing there. Well, oh, okay. All right. Uh, welcome to the show, uh, Victor Pate, um, uh, Cornelius Ricks, and Owen Rogers. As you see, uh, Malcolm in his later days, I think he died a, a month after that. After he made this statement, in all his um, early beginnings, Malcolm was, um, you see in this last piece here, he talked about he worked with anybody. But what was Malcolm's problem at the time? He was fighting with other people in the nation and mainly uh, FBI and everybody else had uh, gotten to a point where was, um, he was too important. Part of what led to his demise has to do with the fact that certainly in his last year, no American universities wanted to hear him speak, no American media, but when he became so popular having traveled throughout Africa, and he was working with the Organization of African American Unity, and he was working to build up an African nation continent-wide, the African people and some Europeans began to realize this man is no fool. He is a leader and he's a dangerous leader. So that he would be invited to speak to Oxford is fascinating because I don't think that anyone uh, at Yale or anyone at City University at the time would have dared invite him to mm. speak. So within, and this is something Brother Ricks was alluding to before we went on the air, you know, so not all of what he did is something that people wanted to hear. He was saying the right thing. But here at home, a lot of people didn't want to hear what he was saying while he was alive. But outsiders, foreigners, were only too glad to have him speak at Yale or in different parts of Africa. Mm. Now, what, now you, what do you think about Malcolm's change from his early beginnings to his last... I mean, I, 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 mean, I studied... Last hurrah. I, I, I've studied Malcolm. I mean, um, I studied with the Nation of Islam. I think that the teachings, I think that every black man in America needs the teachings of Allah Balaj Muhammad at the mm -hmm. time, at the time of that teachings. I think Malcolm, when he went to Mecca, he saw white Muslims in Mecca, he saw the teachings, and he read the he started being more involved in the Quran. And based on being more involved in the Quran, he's seen the changing of, of Islam, which was being taught here as American Islam, and what was being taught in Mecca, yeah, right. in, 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 in the Middle East, was, was, was Islam taught, taught, taught from the Quran. And I think one of the things that Allah Balaj Muhammad was teaching in America was 
basically teaching self-respect and self-education as mm -hmm. well as in self, self economical growth. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I learned through, t through the teaching and reading is one of the things that was never taught to the Negro in America was the art of warfare, the art of self-respect, and the art of economical growth. Mm -hmm. And those three things you need as a people. But what the brother said, I disagree with what the brother said about Malcolm at the time of his death and people dealing with him. Malcolm's always been the most sought after black man in America, more so than Malcolm X, even when he was in the nation of Islam. People mm -hmm. were very, very concerned about what Malcolm was saying in the philosophy. Anytime you beat a man with an eighth grade education that knew the dictionary from word for word and every dictionary in the, in, in, the, in the dictionary, they wanted to sit down with him and just read his mind just to see if he was intelligent enough to deal with the philosophy and the education and what he's read dealing with the, the slave master's language or the English language. Malcolm uh, became an executor of that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Malcolm was the most powerful black man in America, even if certain people don't want to commit it. He was more powerful th even than Martin Luther King. You know, at the time of dealing with his philosophy and what Malcolm was you teaching. You thought so? Yeah, actually. If you read the, the strips on Malcolm, Malcolm was going to more being sought after white, more white schools than, than King was ever sought after, if you start reading the book. Victor? Yeah, I think that um, one of the most unique things of Brother Malcolm is the fact that he had this ability to speak the truth. And mm -hmm. when he spoke the truth, people knew from the words that he was saying and how he was able to reveal the true nature of our government and how they were really not trying to help people, especially black people in this land, and that he had this ability that he could bring people of all nationalities together. And at that particular point, he actually, as far as the government was concerned, became a threat because he was a profound educator. And not only did he speak about the Quran, he also taught the human being side of how people were supposed to treat each other and how everyone had to a right to live comfortably and a right to live free without harassment to not be able to be starving, to be able to uplift themselves and to educate one another. Mm -hmm. And this was a unique quality that he had and that made him such a dynamic human being in our times. I, well, Malcolm to me, uh, uh, Malcolm to me showed me how you go through a, 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 a revelation and finding out the truth about, you know, how black people deal with each other. That's what I've got on Malcolm. And it's this final statement. <clears throat> Malcolm said uh, at the end that uh, I work with anybody. There's no limit to who I, I, I won't deal with. Anybody that's ready to get rid of this, uh, uh, this yoke on around our throat. All right? Now, next, the next roll in is uh, something I think affected everybody. Would you roll the next roll in and we'll come right back at you. we say to America is be true to what you said on paper. If I lived in China or even Russia or any totalitarian country, maybe I could understand some of these illegal injunctions. Maybe I could understand the denial of certain basic First Amendment privileges because they haven't committed themselves to that over there. But somewhere I read of the freedom of assembly. Somewhere I read of the freedom of speech. Somewhere I read of the freedom of press. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. So just as I say we aren't going to let any dogs or water hoses turn us around, we aren't going to let any injunction turn us around. Well, I don't know what will happen now. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter with me now because I've been to the mountaintop. I don't mind. 
Like anybody, I would like to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over. And I've seen the promised land. I may not get there with you. But I want you to know the night that we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. I don't think any of us can be satisfied in the United States until that war is brought to an honorable end and American soldiers are brought back here to the United States. One day... We will have to stand before the God of history and we will talk in terms of things we've done. And it seems that I can hear the God of history saying, that was not enough, but I was hungry and you fed me not. No. Which leads us into... Uh fed me not and I was in jail and nobody came to see me. <laughs> so we uh, are talking about second chance. Uh, that's why Victor Pate is here and uh, Cornelius uh, Ricks. Uh, we're talking about a law library on a uh, 127th Street that you're trying well, to build? What, what are the things we're doing? Make a it, comment about Malcolm and Martin, how they try to help well, and in comparison to what you're trying to do to, to fight well, free, you know, one of the things you talked about is supposed to deal with Malcolm as well as dealing with um, King. Freedom of speech comes with a certain type of um, depth to it. Sometimes when you speak the truth, you can dive in freedom of speech. America tells you that you have freedom of speech. You can speak any, speak on any topic, any topic you want to speak on, but people die for that. Malcolm died, Malcolm died for his issues dealing with, dealing with the, they say, within the nation of Islam. The people always talk about how Malcolm was, was assassinated. And one of the things, that the last speech that King did was at Riverside Church talking about the Vietnam War. He was assassinated right after that. Um, this was the last speech. No, the last speech, I think, was at Riverside Church. Was that the no, one at Riverside Church? Mountain 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 okay. Mountain well, Mountain I thought it was the night before he died. Okay, yes. I didn't realize that. I yeah. thought that right after he spoke at Riverside Church, three days after that he died, I think he was killed. It was a year to the date. Yeah. So my thing is that by dealing with that particular issue, yeah. I said freedom of speech in America is not necessarily freedom of speech for, uh, other than death. So when you speak the truth, see, sometimes when people call people radical, when you start dealing with a radical movement in America and black folks start speaking about certain issues that exist in our communities, that's, that's like we deal with the disfranchised in, in the urban communities, they with a law library. People die for things like that. People are being, um, being, a, being um, targeted for things like that. And one of the things we're doing, as well as I deal with the law library, I've been sitting around for the last past 56 years, and what I've been seeing is nothing being done dealing with the disfranchisement of black men in America. And one of the things I was doing was sitting down one day... What do you mean you see, see nothing being done? Well, basically it seemed that on my end, it's like when, when King talked about being in jail, no one came to see him. Mm -hmm. One of the things I learned when, I, when they locked me up and fabricated a case and beat me up and told me to keep my mouth shut under the attack administration, and after being locked up, I realized that it was something that I had to do. And one thing I did was live in the law library. Mm -hmm. And by living in the law library, I just studied cases. People How called me Malcolm. How much time did you spend? Well, they sent this to me on a, on, a, on a fabricated case. They gave me one to three. They turned around and gave me a Because I sued them after they beat me up. I had three lawsuits going against the state of New York. Mm -hmm. I wasn't going from a, from a bus accident, then going from a, from, a, from a due process case that they fabricated on me and resentenced me, gave me a one to three, and then brought me back down a year later and gave me another one to three, made my, my sentence six years, beat me up and told me to keep my mouth shut. You spent six years? In right. Prison. Judge Paul Kirsten. So when you came out of prison, what was available to you? Well, when I came out of prison, I mean, I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm well groomed as far as like how to deal with life. I mean, I'm not a hoodlum to the point where I'm not educated. So one of the things I did was basically went back to work. I went to work for TV One, started doing different TV shows okay. at TV One. I brought TV One to Harlem with G. Garvey, as mm -hmm. well as they went to Harlem Book Fair, as well as mm -hmm. um, bringing TV One with Kathy Hughes. Okay. So by doing with these particular projects, what's happening is that I started looking at certain programs I was doing. I did Why Does White 
folks write black books, black women in politics, um, direction of black media back stereotypes with Dick Gregory, Reverend Sharpton, as well as dealing with um, Kathy Hughes being the host of the Schoenberg. Mm -hmm. So by doing these particular programs, I was looking at programs and I was seeing how we're being dis disfranchised within the system itself. Mm -hmm. So I, st I started doing programs called Behind the Bench. I always said that white mm -hmm. folks meet judges in the front of the bench and black folks meet judges. I mean, white folks meet judges in the back of the bench and white black folks meet judges in the front of the bench. When white folks commit a, a felony by the time we get the court is a misdemeanor. By the time we admit it commit a misdemeanor, by the time we get the court is a felony. So one of the things we try to do with this particular project, with the uh, program called Behind the Bench and the Friends of the Charitable Community Law Library is deal with addressing urban youth issues of dealing with um, um, due process violations within the state of New York. The state of New York has the highest violation of due process rights in the country, and that's not being done by me or analyzed by me. It was done by the Innocent Project doing the survey, as well as doing what New York One that actually did the, the, the program on the violations that the state of New York has. I would look at Florida, I would look at Atlanta, I would look at um, uh, um, Texas, I was, I mean, I would look at North Carolina, West Virginia, but it's happening right here in the north to here, here in New York City. So by doing these particular programs, we found out that by bringing people to, to these programs we do at the Holland Branch Library on, on West, nine, uh, 9 West 126th um, Street, we found there was a lot of problems there where people were not getting the, um, the reputations they needed to deal with pursuing their cases, housing cases, mm -hmm. uh, um, childhood cases and things like that. So one of these we did, we brought a housing court judge, criminal court judge, family court judge, civil court judge to home to show the legal, the, the legal issues of them addressing issues in the urban community as well as showing the human side of judges. Wait, a lot of wait, times... Wait, wait, wait. What's that? When do we, when do you do all this? I do this once, I do it once a month. I do one program called... Once my, a month? I do it, we have a program coming up next next week mm -hmm. on the 26th at the Holland Branch Library at 9 Same West. time as uh, Legal Night at NAM. Well, NAM was the, NAM, NAM was the one that, that copied my program. Nan was, was one of the people that deal with my. Oh. Yes, Nan, Nan created the program when, when, I, when I was dealing with, with the program with Nan. Nan came along and copied my program behind the bench. I've been doing behind the bench for eight years. Um, Michael Harding was the one that came with the idea of dealing with Legal Night. Um, mm -hmm. Teresa Freeman was actually the host of my program every every night with behind the bench. So when Nan turned every around, night? It, every night, no, no, on every once a, once a once a month at, at the Holland Branch Library. So what happened? Nan came along and created a program called Legal Night, coming from behind the bench. And and I appreciate people dealing with the program itself and creating their own program, but no one does it, does it better than me. This is God's blessing. God has blessed me to do the programs I do. No one can do it better than me. I but sense I, a, a bit of an ego here. Well, I, I, I think every black man in America should have an ego. <laughs> and you know with having an ego. I'm a proud <laughs> black man. You're being humble. I'm a humble man. But about when you start talking about something I've done, the same way that Don King created Soul Train, I, cre I created a legal program I think it's very important that I'm dealing with to make sure that black folks in America deals with a certain amount of legal issues they need to address. And that's what's happening in America. We don't need a politician. We need an attorney. If the, if the politician is going to jail and, and, and you're going to jail, you'd be sharing the same well, jail cell. Uh, how are you going to help the people? Well, basically helping the people is basically dealing with petitions in court. It's Thing, instead of walking down the street singing we shall overcome, what we need to do is start occupying courtrooms, start occupying the state office building. The main thing is basically putting petitions in court. The same thing we talk about the, the um, patent frisk. Patent frisk is instead of walking down the street standing in front of Bloomberg's house, we should be standing in front of a courthouse. We should be down the courthouse filing petition you, showing that there's a, there is a... Do you work well with people? Who's that? You. I work very well with people. I work very, very well with people, but a lot of times what happens is that I have an agenda and by having an agenda, mm -hmm. my agenda is actually being straightforward and being able at, be, being able to, to stay stay focused and keep the eye on the prize. And that's what we try to do with the law library. Well, tell me what you and Victor, how you and Victor are working together for, with his second Victor, family. can I explain that? Victor, Victor is one of our executive uh, directors at the law library. He's the one that puts together the programs as well. When I, when I need something done, as far as we're bringing people on the program, Victor has a, has a, has a phone book where you can make a phone call mm -hmm. and bring people on. Mm -hmm. Victor is somebody that's been um, incarcerated as well, as far as like, dealing with addressing issues that he thinks is important, as far as like, incarceration for black men in America. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of times what's happening, we've been disfranchised to the point where America has not committed, they committed a crime. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is, well, we're trying to want us to com commit to a crime that they, that that we have done, but what crime have America committed to and apologize for what they have done to black folks in America? And this is what we're trying to do with the law library. I think, I think that uh, my colleague, Mr. Courtney, is here, um, basically hit everything on the head. Um, I'm uh, more particularly uh, with the uh, New York City chapter of National Action Network. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm the chairman of Second Chance Program. Mm -hmm. um, I came to NAN, I believe, in about 2009, you know, 
just to really see what they were doing. I was always interested in the work that Reverend Sharpton did. Um, after sitting in on a couple of meetings, I got to talking with a few friends of mine and, you know, started to listen and, and talk. And I, and, I, and I didn't hear something that I thought that I would hear. And what I was looking to hear was what Nan had or was doing to help the formerly incarcerated people that are mm -hmm. coming home from prison to reintegrate back into the community. Right. Um, after not hearing this, I just got to talking with a few people, and more particularly, I have to mention his name, a colleague of mine, his name is Dennis Levy. Um, him and I got together, we got to talking, and we sort of like figured that they needed to have something at the National Action Network that addressed formerly incarcerated people and mm -hmm. helping them make the transition, connect with the services to help them reintegrate into the community and with their families. Mm -hmm. uh, we presented our program um, <clears throat> at the time to uh, uh, the project director. She forwarded it up the chain, the protocol. They reviewed it. They liked it. Um, they came back and they told us we can go ahead and go forward with the, with the program. And basically our mission statement uh, for the Second Chance program is basically threefold. First mission statement is to provide life skill training to the formerly incarcerated and assisting them in making a positive transition into the community. Mm -hmm. How do we do that? We provide life skills training program to help them when they come out to get resumes if they need certificates of relief or certificates of good conduct which for people who have felonies or misdemeanors on their record would actually remove some of the barriers to employment that people who have convictions on their records from their records that would allow them to become employed in various fields where without these certificates they would be barred from those particular types of employment. Mm -hmm. Which is another reason why in addition to providing a life skills training program we also address legislative changes in laws that disproportionately and negatively affect people that have criminal convictions on their record. Mm -hmm. And we do these different things by we go to Albany and we advocate the legislators who mm -hmm. actually are responsible for these laws and work towards having these laws changed mm -hmm. so that they will be given a better opportunity to reintegrate into society, whether it be through higher education, whether it through, be through employment or even through plant training program. Mm -hmm. So this is just some other components that we address with the Second Chance Committee. Now, everyone deserves a chance to redeem themselves in life. We all make mistakes. We are only human. And the way the laws are set, when you come out, you are discriminated against legally yeah. because yeah. of the in so. housing areas and employment areas and you are kept out of the mainstream of society. Mm -hmm. Prisons create another underclass of people and disproportionately affects us as Afro-Americans. Oh. And we needed to have something that would address this issue. So this is why we came up with the Second Chance program. And thanks to Reverend Sharpton and the rest of the Nan family, we were able to do and continue to do the program at the New York City Nan chapter. I think it's significant that we started with a reflection on uh, Brother Malcolm because it is very rarely acknowledged yeah, that among the most significant groups that has successfully done rehabilitation, the Nation of Islam is miles ahead of any other group that has successfully done rehabilitation. And when Brother Ricks talks about the need to prepare people to do warfare on the streets, the need to prepare people for economic, the things that were necessary that brothers who are incarcerated need to do, not many people were teaching the brothers that. And the Nation of Islam was significant and continues to be significant in rehabilitating brothers who have been incarcerated. We have tens of thousands of brothers who are being re-released into our community every month. And we need to be you know, prepared how to deal with that. One thing to, to note about that, right after they really figured out how Malcolm got as smart as he got, they started closing down the libraries and the prisons. The free education for prisoners, <laughs> <laughs> but the budget cuts, but supposedly. That but, that, but that there, which was like dealing with that, that there was completely a, a, a violation of due process rights. They don't do that anymore. But the one of the things that's going on, they don't, to, they don't do that anymore. The Every, free college has been cut out. Excuse, excuse me. Ooh. What's happening, what's going, no, no, no. The, the, the law library is, is, is a, it's a cost, it's a federal bill that has to stay open. Oh, uh, you're, you're talking about the law library. The bottom line is what's happening when you're in prison. No, 
in prison. The law library stays open. Anybody wants to go to the library, they can go to the library. What's so, what's so incredible about the law library in the prison system, you find brothers that are, that are in the prison system are better. They may not have a license, but they're paralegals. They have, more, they're more, mm -hmm. they have, they have a genius more mm -hmm. powerful than the lawyers that was handling the case. A lot of brothers that handle cases in prisons get out of prison by them handling and teaching and learning the law in prison. One of these we try to do with the law library is saying, why should a black man go upstate or go to Rikers Island to, be, to go to a law library? We go to, I mean, white folks have law libraries in their community. Why isn't mm -hmm. there law libraries in urban communities? Right. You have brothers that are coming out of prison. We're looking at brothers coming out of prison. We're telling brothers come out of prison. If you go to jail and you, and you come out and, you, and you're a parent and you, and you want to become a paralegal, we'll bring you into the law library so you can work in the law library on cases within the law library. Okay, we, 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 what we're trying to do is create jobs. There's only 3% of black doctors in this country, there's only 12% of black lawyers. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, we're saying we need to start educating our people. And by educating our people, we need to start dealing with the issues and educating people in the fields that we have issues in. We got to start dealing with the law. The law is the big, we call ourselves Afro-Americans. Mm -hmm. We know nothing about Africa and we know nothing about America. We know nothing about the Constitution. The main thing we need to do is start studying the Constitution and understanding that every time a white person wants to deal with challenging Barack Obama or challenging America or challenging the state of New York, they bring it to court. And that's one of the things that we have to learn how to do and start put, putting petitions together to bring into the to bring into courts to deal with addressing our issues as black folks in America. Let's deal with the problem of why most black men go to prison. Well, a lot of times, let, let me. Finish. I'm sorry, brother. What? The basic problem of why most people get put in prison is because of their anger and their temperament or their lot in life or how they feel about themselves. It's usually anger. Now, what does a black man deal with, how does a black man deal with his anger when he's being persecuted and, 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 and abused as we have been, uh, slavery and so forth and so I, on? I, All I, that I, anger. I, I think that Malcolm, that, how did Malcolm deal with his anger? But this is the bottom line. Malcolm dealt with his anger by going to the Nation of Islam. And that, and, 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 and that and became Martin a psychiatrist. With his anger? Ma Malcolm, I mean, um, he, he dealt with uh, Gandhi and he's also went into, went into the church. But the thing is, what you got to understand well, what is What happened that, with, the, with Malcolm? Well, but, but, well, I'm going to say to you real quick, brother. A lot of times white folks will go see a psychiatrist, the dog peed on the rug. What happens is that a lot of times black people don't realize they're crazy. So sometimes you need to... You need. You just said something. <laughs> we don't get psychiatric care we need. We need. That's we, the bottom line. Sometimes, sometimes you, sometimes you, sometimes you, you got to get certified. You know what I'm trying to say? So, like, like you're somebody, speaking from personal experience. Let's right? not go there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the, yeah, before psychology is No, no. Wait a minute. I'm old enough to have been crazy. No, no. no I, well, hey, listen. listen I was a lunatic at one time. I don't mind being I out of my bunkers. I went to see a psychiatrist. I told the psychiatrist crazy. I was crazy. Okay, but I understand. You have to be reprogrammed. I mean, I was out of my Mind. But you have to be reprogrammed. And you couldn't say anything. I'm talking about anger. Mm. No, but you can understand I mean, that. You have to kill anybody or to kill anybody. But white folks don't have to be angry to go yeah, see a listen psychiatrist. To me. Yeah. Listen to me. Listen to me a minute. Now, we know your problem. We all have that same problem. We all deal with it differently. When I was in the Corps 19 to 23, between 60 and 64, I spent in the Marine Corps. Now, I was one of three Marines, three black men in a platoon of 75. I came out of boot camp with a stripe on my arm. I was so gun ho. They taught me how to kill people, man. I came home on the block, 30 pounds heavier. Everybody ran, man. And don't let me get drunk. Oh, God. I'm issue. plucking out eyes, banging heads against the wall. I was, I was lucky I never killed anybody. Well, black anger is a real God. thing. No doubt right. about it. And Terry Williams no, writes no, about no, that when, quite well. The one time I really tried to kill somebody, the white boy called me nigger. Mm -hmm. I was one, and I went off. I could beat him. I had a fight with him prior to that. And this guy slept three bunks away from me. I took a pipe out of the bathroom and tried to kill this dude. But what we call crazy is nigger. where there is no see, treatment for the mental stress, well, see, mental disorder. I was blessed, and I, out of my anger, I got out of that one. Not everyone is Special able to do that. Marsh. And at one point I'll make also, when you talk about the brothers who are behind bars, there are a great many brothers who are behind bars that have nothing to do with violent crime. When we talk about people okay. who are victimized by stop and frisk and that you mouth off to the police officer and you end up with a felony because then they trump up the charges on you because the police officer has an Anger attitude. Again? When we talk about somebody who jumps the turnstile and they don't have ID on them and then that's being jacked up to a felony. When we talk about somebody with four joints in their pocket and in our community it's being uh, trumped up to a felony. We have a significant enough number of people who are incarcerated who are not there because they committed violent crimes but for other reasons and not the least of which is that they don't know their 
their rights. And this is the other thing that some of the people who have worked with Cornelius educating the public, you don't have rights that you don't know about. Is that, but you know what's so crazy about it? Let me tell you, Victor, real quick. You know what's so crazy about it? We're trying to make sure. You have organizations like Reverend Sharpton. You have organizations like Neighborhood Defenders. You have all of you. have the Legal Aid Society. Now, right now, if, somebody, if, we, if we, we, we're sitting here on this program, somebody said, um, I have a warrant. You call up. The Legal Aid Society, the Legal Aid Society would tell you to go, t go to the nearest precinct and turn yourself in. That's a big mistake. The big, the, what we try to do with the law library and educating black people behind the bench, what we try to do is tell you, give us a call and we'll make sure that an attorney is there before you get to the precinct. Mm -hmm. Okay? If it doesn't fit, you must acquit. So we're trying to make sure that black folks understand they have a right. When white boys go to the precinct or whatever happened to the, 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 either their father as a police officer, a cop, or a lawyer, or even a judge that's there in the precinct representing them. They we talk about whatever. Legal we don't have those legal advocates. We have what we need to do is find those legal advocates. What I find very disturbing with doing the programs we do, mm -hmm called behind the bench, mm -hmm. is that we find more white lawyers and judges on the panels discussing black issues than black lawyers and judges discussing black issues. Because people come to me on the streets and say, oh, Cornelius, I love what you're doing. I think it's exciting what you're doing. I think it's completely outrageous. I like the, the movement you're making. Just just recently, I'm not going to mention your names, I had to go to the precinct the other week. I made sure that a police officer, me that a, a lawyer was there at the precinct and got the person released. Okay? The main thing what, we're trying to, what I'm trying to say to you is that we, a lot of times we don't have those advocates that's there in the community the same way the white community has that so those advocates there in the community and the law library is there because what we're trying to do is influence black youth to go into law we're trying to influence the black youth to start dealing with a medicine understanding medicine mentoring to black youth you brought up the idea of being crazy Give us your, your your experience of when you went off. Well, I I, I'm not crazy to the point where I go off. I just basically what's happening with me wasn't the point of getting going off. It's basically what it, dealt, what it boiled down to. It boiled down to um, frustration. A, a lot of times, like even sitting on a program here talking about the things you're talking about, it becomes very frustrating. Mm -hmm. Okay, it becomes. I mean, you, you may sound. I may sound angry. I may sound upset. But I'm not upset. It's the way I vent. It's a way of me taking it off my chest. I do this because number one, I see so much going on and no one is saying anything about it. I see so many things that's going on by people in the communities that, that people are being disfranchised, being murdered and no one's talking about it. What we need to do with, with some of the crime that's going on in the community, especially with urban youth violence, we just have to start admitting to ourselves a lot of times we bring, we, we, we're murdering ourselves. There have been more black men killed in Chicago in one year there was a killed in the Iraq war. Of the Afghanistan war. We have to change that philosophy. How you we know? treat each other. But the bottom line, we have to change that philosophy <laughs> through, through education. Because if you, if you don't change it through education, you'd be a walking fool. So what we're trying to well, do. Well, I, we try to educate people on this program about how to deal with themselves. Yes, sir. All right. I understand you know, that. I mean, I, reason I bring up this, this craziness of mind, mm -hmm. because a lot of people don't even realize it. That a lot of people look like me, you would never think I would do something crazy like that. But people well, that I know that suit fool me. We have to huh? be careful. The suit, the suit doesn't fool me. The suit doesn't fool me. <laughs> we have to be careful about what we call. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't look that crazy. I see some fools with suits on. So, so, I mean, what we have to do is understand in New York City. <laughs> in New York I see some City, fools with suits on. That's what you're trying to say. Age where we live. <laughs> what was I trying to say? What was I trying to say before you went there? About being crazy. I've seen fools in bow ties. You know. <laughs> we have to be very, very careful about who labels us and what labels we have to see to. There is, an, there is a significant African proverb that says, it doesn't matter what you call me, it's what I answer to that's critical. Hey, and we have to understand sure. that in New York City in this day and age, it's considered normal, if I see a brother out here on 59th Street uh, lying on the sidewalk, it's considered normal to step over him and keep on going. If mm. you stop and say, your brother, do you need some help? Are you crazy? Why don't you leave that man by himself? What is crazy, we have to be very careful about that. Because there are certain things that are considered normative crazy by other folks and for a black man to say priority is our black people you're considered somewhat crazy in some ways mm -hmm. for you to devote hours and years to a program like this not being paid there are people who say that man gives this is crazy I told the story because at a time in my self-analysis of me uh, where I understand you know what changed my attitude you know uh, of what what, what drove me to, to, to do certain things. And I assume that, you know, there are as many ways of being black as there are black people. Of course. So uh, your interpretation of how to do things is your interpretation. And you have to be, uh, 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 you, I think you have to be humble enough to understand that other people have a different interpretation than you do. Mm -hmm. and how to handle a certain thing. You know, brother, I respect, you know, what you just said. I'm going to let Paige speak for a minute, too, but I'm going to say this. Did I'm I finish I'm sorry, brother. saying what I was going to say? I'm sorry, go ahead. 
<laughs> no, no, no. You, I, you I know what you, I mean? But I just well, well, go ahead. Go ahead. Say what you're no, going to say. I, I, you know what? I, I understand the other people's philosophy of how to deal with their issues and how we, we all have a different mat, I mean, a different method to our madness. You know, I, I always say that every black man before he goes to a white average school needs to do two years in a, in a black school to learn about self. Because what happens if he doesn't go to a black school to learn about self, he'll mm -hmm. be a walking fool. Mm -hmm. So the bottom line is what we're trying to do with the law library is bring people in that, that's able to read, write, and actually deal with interpreting the law. Because um, what happens a lot of times, when you go to court and a judge looks at you and you say, oh, Your Honor, I didn't realize you would give me 15 years for that, but the judge says, we can't help if you, if you didn't understand the law. We can understand that you didn't read the law. But see, white folks understand the law before they get there and how much time they're going to get on the crime they committed. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying Where were you born? Excuse me? Where were you born? I was born here in New York. My mother was, okay. my mother was going to Columbia University. My mother actually graduated from... Uh, Virginia State and got her master's in early mm -hmm. childhood education. She named the school after me called Ricky Day Kindergarten. Um, my mother came to um, to New York and went to school at um, at Columbia University and got her doctorate mm -hmm. in early childhood education and graduated with Shirley Chisholm. Um, I was one of the kids on Sesame Street, I did Sesame okay. Street as a child. So um, you were privileged coming up. I wouldn't call that privilege. I mean, the bottom line is that I mean, I, I was a, I was a, I came from a middle class family. That taught me values. That's, that's privilege in a black community. You saw the world outside of Harlem. But no, no, but the problem is, I don't like that. You know what I mean? I don't like in, in my don't community, like that. In my community, in my community, no, 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 in my community where I lived, that there were black, there were, there were, I knew, I knew, I knew, a, 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 I knew thousands, thousands of educated There's black no folks. Being no, 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 no. I'm not. No, listen, no, why are you going? Why are you giving me first psychology, me, brother? You know, you always beat me up. How old are you? I know you. You know, what? You, I mean, you just give Chris experience. You know, you know I'm not going to. You know what? You know, you know what's so crazy about it? I've known you. For years, and I, and I finally, you know what? I finally taught my, I learned about you, so I know how far, how, where we go with this thing, and I'm not going to feed into me? it. I but no, 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 I'm not going to feed into it me? because you're the advocate, advocate. But oh, I, love, I, love, I love you, I love you, I love you. But you know what? The bottom line is, we cannot always say. I mean, every kid that comes out of a a middle class family or a rich family doesn't mean that that kid was going to follow the footsteps of their fathers. Some of the worst kids in the world, especially oh, white so kids, you have from, to defend yourself. No, no, I'm not defending. I'm not defending myself being privileged. I'm not privileged. I mean, I don't think I'm in better than anybody else. I'm a brother, just like that's why I'm in the hood. That's why I'm in the hood okay. doing what I do we because all, I understand that a lot of times we don't get a chance to, to, to meet the people like judges and lawyers outside of that bench and making sure that every black child and every black man and every black woman in America has a legal right in this country and making sure that they're not being railroaded or prosecuted in the wrong way of, of their due process rights being violated. Did By you, doing that, did you, you didn't did say you, that to King, I mean, Martin Luther King. He came from a privileged family. I don't think that just because you come from a privileged family make you better than anybody else. A rhetorical question I'd like to ask you about. I don't think you're better than anybody else. I know better than you. Does 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 give you access to education? See what I mean? Does education you have, allow you to become bourgeoisie? Which see, is a critical, I'm not a bourgeoisie. You know, you know, I've never been bourgeoisie in my entire life. See, I don't, see I, being know, black, I don't like that being word. Black, I'm a black man. That's right. Being black man. See, here's our problem. Here's our problem. Our problem. That's Dr. Gilchrist. Our problem. What's your prognosis? Why me? Why me? Why me? Why are we in the middle conversation sitting here? But now, here's one thing. It's a general conversation. I love you. We all talk about being brother. black in America. You, that's all. Yes, sir. That's yes, sir. Yes, sir. That, was another, that was another program that, that was a farce. To the, to the, to the being black chair, in America. Well, that's what this program, program is about. Here's why we, how to deal with the problem. That's when Ms. O'Brien became black. Program, that's right. Is yeah, after they arrested him. We, we need to be able to create a bridge of communication and education and upliftment to our people, which is one of the reasons why with the Second Chance program mm -hmm. and the brother Cornelius here and myself got together that's and right. we support right. this program because it is conducive to our community to definitely, especially yes, sir. people right. coming home, they need to be able to come home, not to cold shoulders and turned backs. They need to be able to come That's home right, to feel welcome. That's right. A lot of brothers and sisters, our fathers, mothers, brothers, children are coming home that don't have families, don't have resources, don't have networks. So there should be a hand out to say, come on, sister, right. come on, brother. That's right. I can help you out. I can and, show and you and here. I can take you there. You know, I, 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 I work for a church. Uh, uh, Common Avenue Baptist Church mm -hmm. and we took in some you know ex-prisoners and they thought that you know church people were suckers <laughs> downright suckers and this guy came off to me actually I brought him down here 
He tried to steal something from somebody. Oh, Jesus. I, I said, <laughs> well, you know what? what is I wrong? Think, I think uh, let me finish. Right. What, how do you get over the, the con that comes out of most people that have been in prison? How they figure they can get over this smarter than everybody well, else? Well, well, I mean, because I mean, they have been privileged in life. Would no, <laughs> you not know, go to prison to be a but thief? You, There's people that's walking around and never got caught being a thief. The Bible, what we're trying to do also with the mentioning of church, we're trying to make sure that every black church in America has a prison ministry and a legal ministry. But Why you should answer, black people have to leave out of the church? You're not Republican, too, now. Excuse me? <laughs> you didn't answer the question. What's that? <laughs> let me say, let me answer. Let me answer. I think, I think. That, no, that, every, I'm say that everything, no, sorry, sorry, that I think that everything, <laughs> everything over the con that develops in the prison. It's, well, I'm getting ready to address okay. that. All right. Okay. When you come home, we got brothers and sisters that have been there for decades, okay? Yeah. There has to be what I, what I consider a debriefing period. Oh, the time from prison to community. Yeah. Okay. At this particular time, this is what we do at the Second Chance Program, okay? We create fellowship first and foremost amongst the formerly incarcerated mm -hmm. because you are coming into an environment or, uh, if you will, a forum setting right. of like-minded people who've been where you've been, who've done what you've done, who have made progress in their lives, who have changed okay. their mind, right. who have, 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 um, have redeemed themselves to a degree, have earned community trust again, mm -hmm. have earned trust amongst the people, and you bring them along with you, right. and you okay. show them right. by right. example that, yes, although I've been where you've been, I've done what you've done, I've felt what you felt, and now I'm here, mm. and this is what I did. Here, come this way. Let me help you. Let me show you the steps. Let me debrief you. Because you, when you come out of there, you need debriefing. Mm. Like people yeah. that go to, go to war, they need to be Big debriefed time. before they are reintegrated back into society. So mm. this is what we do at the mm. Second Chance Committee. We help debrief them and helping them in reintegrate to regain their self-esteem, to know that you don't have to con people, that their people will give you a second chance. But, but you, you know, have to earn that second chance. Sister, look, I'm sorry, and I think that that's very important that we do that, that we have more programs that address these issues of the formerly incarcerated, people that are coming home, to help them with the resources, to help them get over the stigma of being a quote-unquote convict. Because you know you're not going to be a know, convict question, I direct to you, no, no. so you might best be able to answer this. How do you develop a trust between you and another you, black you know, man? You know, let me tell you something, Doc. I, what, I, I love you, 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 you heard the question. I heard, I heard the okay. question, but I'm just going to say something on a point you made earlier. I just want to make it very clear to you. You mentioned a guy that you brought down here. There was, a, there was an ex-offender or whatever you call him that he came down and he tried to steal something from somebody. You don't have to be an ex-offender to come down here and steal from somebody. People, the, the people sometimes when, yeah, when you that, ask that George... That was not my when you, No, no, let me, this is just what you said. But I'm saying, but you know, when I they ask George... Boy, let me just say something to you real quick, brother. Let, let me, Go ahead, I'm sorry. Be, wherever you're going with this, but what I was trying to show is that most people that come out of prison, if you take them to a church, they think... Pe no, people mistake kindness for weakness. Well, and I, a brother is good at that. But well, well, I, mean, I, I, I think white folks are good at that too. Oh, but they own up to some of our problems. That's why I want you to own up to it. No, a lot of us have this problem. Has a great, let me explain something to you so you understand something. Your church convent, I, I, I respect that church. I respected the Reverend that passed away. Um, I Grant. The, Re Re Grant. Grant was a wonderful pastor. You okay, Grant, Grant was one of the ones that dealt with that initiative to bring brothers <laughs> into, right. into the church working <laughs> exactly. out of prison. Now, the That's bottom right. line is that every church in America, black church in America should be open with open arms like that, dealing with a program that he's talking about. Even this program where he's talking about re-entry into the community. Every church yeah, yeah, in America, yeah, yeah. black church in America, should be dealing with a re-entry program. You said yeah, that about need, being conning. Yeah, yeah, no, we need to get you a program where you can just sit in and bring in your flock. No, that's not, it's not a flock, brother, but you know what it is, No, brother? but you, it's, you it's, can't it's a, do all this. In direct answer you, to your you, question. You, yeah, it's no, and, and you see how difficult it is for black people to get along with each other? Yeah. Well, well, that's part of when you ask the question. Don't you how, think? How do we get one black person to know? Don't you, you know, think black you know, people have a problem getting along brother, with each other? But you know what the problem? What we need to do? Don't you think? No, what we what we need to do? That's our biggest problem, isn't it? No, but brother, you know what's our biggest problem? One of the biggest problems we have 
is, is getting along with each is, other. Is understanding each other. The thing is, I think one of the biggest problems we have is understanding each other and understanding how we vent and understanding how sensitive this conversation is. Well, stop this, blaming our problem no, on somebody I'm else. not trying to blame the problem on anybody, but I didn't say that. What I'm trying to tell you, what we need to do is sit here. This, is, this conversation is so heavy. And when you start talking about this type of conversation, it kicks up the hairs on the back of my neck. And by doing that, it, it's so sensitive to you the public. You and everybody else black. Yeah, okay, but the, the, we're not talking everybody else black. Give them talk about me. So oh, the reason yeah. why, and the reason why I'm going that's okay. right, and that's why I'm going there because I think it's important <laughs> to understand that this thing, this is what you're talking about. We can go all day with this because it's because everything that you mention, no, no, but everything that you mention is so sensitive mm -hmm. that it that, that you, you can't explain it in one program. No, you can't explain it in one program. So by doing that. By by me saying the things I'm saying, speaking the way I'm speaking, speaking the fast I'm speaking, I'm trying to get it in there. And the thing is, is that by getting it in there, you bring up some great points and great, uh, great, great philosophy on these things. Sometimes we have to be reprogrammed. It's just like a Amen. computer; it's input, export. You can't get out, get something out of something if it's not there. So what we got to do is in, in insert that that philosophy or that educational philosophy that you're talking about into these people and sit so down with the, them. The first with, the first example we showed was my. Malcolm. Malcolm, 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 Malcolm went into the nation Islam, did his religion. studies, in fact, did his studies in prison. So he the thing is, that he found religion in prison, which is the biggest thing going today, is the nation of Islam being in the prisons. At one time, they didn't want the nation of Islam within the prisons. Okay, and then because they seen the way that black men were coming out and empowering <laughs> themselves in the urban communities, it was only one philosophy, and you started dealing with the teachings of all of our Muhammad. Look at what uh, uh, Malcolm's downfall was. Downfall. Well, I, I want his, to tie his, his own. His own what failed him, what most hurt Malcolm was Elijah Muhammad having affairs with seven young girls. Well, I, th I, I think Elijah like Muhammad was, 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 was human too. So I think you while you're dealing with that, about that's not what I'm talking other. about. And it's critical. I, I don't want you to defend everything that I say. I want you to think about us but what I'm saying, each other. I'm saying what, how that, what brought Malcolm down was he had all this praise for Elijah Muhammad. Certain personal things became public and political. And all we right. have to avoid that because personal conflicts have become public and political and then other people collateral, collateral damage. But I think mm -hmm. your question about black folks trusting each other is critical. And you are appearing to be a sucker if you're a deacon or a minister in the church and you're giving me a place to stay but then uh, you're not really following through. If I see that you're fighting against what is civil death about me not being able to get a job because of that box it says I have a record. If I see mm, that you're fighting to prevent yeah, my grandma yeah. being evicted because she lets me stay with her and she can't have an ex-felon, if I see that you're fighting for things that seriously affect me, you're no longer a sucker, but you're somebody who's on my side. Mm -hmm. But I have to be able to see that to trust you. If I don't see you doing that, and right. all I see you doing is giving out a hot plate of food every Thursday, then you are a sucker. So we right. need to see that we have each other's interests at heart. Yeah. And that is what is the building of trust. And two things I want to tie into that. The first is Dr. Joy Leary. Again, we've been, t and certainly the Willie Lynch letter. We have been mm -hmm. taught to hate people who look like us. That is no accident. We've been taught Willie that Lynch. for 400 Willie years. Lynch. We Big have time. been taught that. Light and dark. To undo Especially. that. This is this is some of the debriefing that Brother Ricks. To undo that is not easy. Uh -huh. To get many of us to the point where we understand, hey, you may be Baptist, I may be Catholic, somebody else may be Methodist, but we can trust each mm. other. It takes a lot of work. And once I see you have my interests at heart, then I can begin to trust. Once I see that my child getting into college mm. is important enough for you to fight for it, once you see that the protection of your wife walking home in the street late at night is as important to me as my wife and daughter, then we trust each other once we identify common interests. But that is something that not enough time, and this is where Brother Pape certainly uh, working with some of the people who've been incarcerated, they need to see that we have their interests at heart. Until they do, we are those suckers who may be victimized by them. But and once they see us fighting on their behalf, then the trust is built and it's engendered and strengthened. And, and, and see, see, I don't trust most men that are angry or hate people just because they're a certain way. Or and black men who hate all white people. <clears throat> That's nonsense. <laughs> I mean, you look at a man like a Barack Obama. Now, he can't hate white people, can he? He had a different experience with white people, all right? He had a loving mother that was white. Now, uh, you get a lot of black people that say, well, oh, he's not black enough. He don't nothing, nothing about being black. You look at his wife and his family. You tell me you don't have a black man there? But yet he can look at the world in a different view. You know, he can see everybody in a different view. He takes the person as the content of his character. 
the content of their character. If you don't get to, 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 to live as Malcolm did, and these are all examples who have come about and been around this, who I've learned from, Malcolm and Martin. Martin said, judge a person by the content of their character, not the color of their skin. And that means white people, too. Well, you may be preaching to the choir because what happened? I don't know. The fact, that, the fact that gun purchases <laughs> among white people <laughs> have, have, have right? jumped up <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. since <laughs> Barack Obama was elected. <laughs> we have to deal with the fact that there are some white people out there who have uh, even. Farrakhan called him a murderer. Yeah. So I mean, we we have to be careful about that. Your minister. You know. Well, you know, Farrakhan called him a murderer. I, 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 right? I, I don't know where I haven't heard that, but the bottom line is that Barack about Obama, Libya. Uh, well, Barack Obama, well, Libya, Libya, I mean, with Libya, I mean, I did say on you too. Well, mm -hmm. brother, I understand what you're saying, but I'm not going to comment on that. I think if you have any questions about anything that Mr. Farrakhan said, I think you need to talk to Mr. Farrakhan. Well, but like I said before, well, I'm just I mentioning think, it. Subject. No, well, the subject you're talking about, I, I don't. Talk I don't, about I don't, the murder of no, 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 excuse, excuse me, but I don't speak on. I don't speak on. I'm not. I'm not a. I, I'm not a philosophy dealing with the teachings. I don't care of, enough about Gaddafi mm -hmm. to attack an American. Well, we President well, I, 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 I think, well, <laughs> no, well, I should. Well, but, but we I should care do. more about Obama than I do Gaddafi. Well, but, but you need to concern yourself also how white folks are saying what they're saying to Obama and about Obama. Like when I was talking about the other TV shows on last week, I made I it very clear. I care more about what black people are saying about but, Obama. When I, I showed the other week on the TV show, <laughs> you know the, white, the white guys on the TV show looked at me and said to me, when we talk, talk about reparations, he tells me that white folks and the, I mean, black folks deserve reparations. He believes that the, the, the statute of limitation ran out. I said the statute of limitation ran out on murder. And I said, and he's going to tell me he looks at me to be the same. Why would you let that bother you? Well, I didn't say it bothered me, but, it, but it, the issue... Well, why would you go into a rage? Well, I didn't, I didn't go into any rage. What I did you was... You know how stupid white people can be about it, us? Okay, well, we can go... That's another, that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. That's another issue, on. though. But what I'm saying to you is what yeah, I said yeah, to yeah. him. <laughs> what I said you, to him... You've never been around white then, people then, that then, never met any black people? But then what he said to me, that's another issue. <laughs> but then, but then, but then, what he, then what he then what he, then what he said to me, he said to me that he thinks that I'm equal to him, and he thinks that everything, like Barack Obama being in the White House, or Barack Obama was equal to all the other white folks that's been in the White House. And I says, I never heard of anybody threatening to kill a black, a white man in the White House the way they've been threatening to kill Barack Obama. I never heard anybody How's threatening Obama to kill Obama. handling but, it? But, but Obama, that's another issue. I, 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 like I said before, uh, wait a I'm minute. just trying. Wait a minute, I'm that's another issue. Well, I'm just trying to address the issue. That's the person who's talking. Well, <laughs> They're talking me. about him. Yes, I understand that. So but don't you, aren't you concerned on how he's handling well, it? I think of Barack Obama dealing with, where, like you said, the way he was raised and coming from the concept of his, of his, of his, of his philosophy. I think he's handling it very well because number one, I wouldn't be able to handle it the way he's handling it. Of right? course because, not. because number one, um, even You're from the, the even for, even for, well, but I'm not trying to claim to be the president, but I'm just saying even from where he came from, running for um, the Senate out of Chicago, beating the Daily Machine, beating the. Yeah, the, the, look the, at the, that. The, 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 the Jesse Jackson machine and then coming to New York City and beating the Hillary Clinton machine and coming a senator. The main thing, I think he's a genius. I think he's one of the most intelligent black men in the country. Amen. But the thing is, I, 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 I respect Barack Obama. I, 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 I love Barack Obama. I think he's the most intelligent man other than being black in the White House. And that's like I told what I said to, to when I was campaigning for Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton said that she has, she, she has, she, she has, she's more qualified to be president than Barack Obama. Only qualification she had was living in the White House, okay? So the bottom line is that, oh, come on. Like, like I said before, <laughs> but she's the first lady, she didn't do anything else, she, was, she didn't run for anything until she ran for Senate here in New York City. But like that, by saying that, I'm saying to you is that I think Barack Obama is handling and being a constitutional lawyer, as well as Michelle Obama being another genius in law, hey, I think they understand what we have to do. They understand mm -hmm. the, 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 the fight that we have dealing with the laws that's here in America. Just like when you're talking about stand your own ground law that was down in Florida. Okay, these oh. things have to be changed. A lot of times what happens in the urban community, we don't hold the people or politicians responsible for what they do. A lot of times we'll run to the state office building to these different places to get legal help and find out the person you're sitting there with is the one to create the law. All right, let, let, okay, let's get sir? to my bottom line. Uh, my bottom line here I'm is sorry. the reason why I do the Gilchrist experience. Yes, I sir. take you through this exposure of your own personality <laughs> and who you are yes, sir. just to show your struggle with being black in America. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, my whole purpose here is to show what sort of insanity I went through. And I'm 71. You look great. Everybody knows. I didn't know that, brother. And I'm, that's just a blessing. So, so I know God is real. You age well. 
I, but God is in charge. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, that's right. You know what? I love you for saying that. God got me here. God now, is now, in now, charge. Remember what you said today when right. it was raining outside? You said you, the first show that you had that, that people got here on time. It's pouring down rain outside, storm and lightning. I was concerned about a lightning bolt hitting the umbrella, but I knew it was in God's hands. And, and see, that tells see, you the brothers see, are my purpose respect. now. That's that's you do. I was see, hurt. see, you're still <laughs> in, in the rain. But see, you're still in a service to self mode. Hmm. No, I'm not that. Wait, let me, I'm get, sorry. Let me finish. Go, I'm sorry. Go ahead. You go in there. Go ahead. Back with the kitchen. He's starting. 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 Service to self mode. I have been And the point is that when we, we'll get along better. I've got four minutes to go. We'll get along better if we go to service to others. See, this is how, this is how we learn to trust and love one another. That's how the God in me loves the God in you. See, that's where the marriage is. Yes, sir. That's where the bond is. Yes, sir. And I, I think any black man that doesn't have God in his life is a dead man. You're walking says around dead. We are our brother's keeper. Right. When that question was asked Amen. of Cain, <laughs> what happened to his brother Abel that he had slain? Yeah. And in the Quran, it talks <laughs> right. about one for us, brother, our brothers one will be one for ourselves. Right. So that religious teaching is there that some people have heard and taken seriously. Again, the ministers who take that seriously mm -hmm. earn our respect. We know mm -hmm. enough ministers who will glimpse and they speak those words, but they don't portray it in their mm -hmm. actions. The, th the three, the four of us who are here today, we represent some of the flavors of how black men are different in this world. Mm -hmm. We are here continuing the education process, which goes on at Cornelius Ricks' forums, which goes on at the Tuesday night meetings at uh, the Second Chance Committee. The mm -hmm. same work that's being done there, educating our people, lifting our people up, is what you do here. Right. And though we miss Gil Noble, we understand and appreciate what you do and his Amen. continuation of his work, which is why when Brother Ricks talked about us being here on time through the rain, mm -hmm. we respect what you do, and we understand so, this is an educational forum that lifts us see, all up. See, so we a, take you a, very seriously, and yeah, this work very seriously. Yeah, this, this, this program makes me humble because this is my therapy hour. Yes, sir. This yes, is sir. how I, I, I give back to the community, and I try to say things that uh, that mean something to somebody. I love, I love for you. Right. My, my thing is yeah. that what I love so much about you, you for me, you, I, you, I always had great respect for you because I've seen how you carry yourself. Mm. I've known you for years. I've known you yeah. at least 20 some years. Yeah. And everything I've seen about you is, is truly respect. I see how you respect me. I see how you respect Reverend Sharpton. I love Reverend Sharpton. I mm. think Reverend Sharpton is the only one out here that's actually speaking the oh, truth. Amen. You know, sometimes other than Allah oh, Mahatma, I don't uh, miss those uh, yeah. You have but, to watch. You have to watch Reverend Sharpton at six o'clock. MSNBC. Uh, MSNBC. <laughs> and the Harlem Book Fair is this Saturday as well. For the people in our audience. Yeah. 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 But he is on MNN at 7 30 on yeah. Saturday. Wow. Well, never knew that. Oh, that's, yeah. that's right. That's right. That's the name of the network. You know, Saturday at 7 30. I did you have the to show watch. with you with Reverend Sharpton. Yeah. Remember, when you brought me on the program with Reverend right. Sharpton. We did yeah. the show together. And but uh, Reverend Sharpton's on board with us. History is a clock that people use to tell their political and cultural time of day. It is also a compass that people use to find themselves on the map of human geography. Yes, Dr. Clark. History tells of people where they have been and what they have been, yes. where they are and what they are. Yes. Most important, history tells a people where they still must go, and what they still must be. Yes, sir. The relationship of history to the people is the same as the relationship of a mother to her child. Yes, sir.